Do you think you will be able to live alone in a forest? Man is one of the most intelligent animal. Still, it is so difficult for us. Think of how difficult it would be for an animal to live in the forest alone. It has to stay together with an animal of its own kind or even of some other kind. When two very different organisms live together for a long time, the relationship is called symbiosis. One type of the said relationship is when one of them gets help while the other animal is harmed. We call this parasitism. A parasitized caterpillar has spent the last 12 days gorging itself. It now appears profoundly obese, but this is not all fact. The glomerata wasp larvae lie just under its skin. Each is the size of a grain of rice, but together, they account for over a third of the caterpillar's weight. The larvae have not yet finished growing and need to keep their host alive. So, although they feast on the caterpillar's blood, they have been careful not to touch a single one of its vital organs. This uneasy truce will not last. Within days, the larvae carefully matured. Suddenly, they begin to stir into action. For the past two weeks, this surrogate womb has protected them, but now they no longer need it. To complete the next stage of their life cycle, they must break out. The caterpillar's thick skin should be a solid barrier to the parasitic wasp larvae. But as their bodies have grown, they have developed tiny saw-like teeth. These jack jaws are for one job only, cutting their way out. Stroke by stroke, the larvae slice through the tough layer of skin. At the same time, they release chemicals that paralyze the caterpillar. As the larvae break through, there is nothing they can do. Free at last, the larvae enter a new phase of development. They swiftly spin silken cocoons. This will provide the perfect environment for their final transformation. But, ironically, one of the greatest dangers the larvae will face is being themselves impregnated by other species of parasitic wasp. Incredibly, the wounded caterpillar helps them out. Usually, a caterpillar would spin a silken blanket to make its own cocoon, but the parasitized caterpillar spins his blanket on top of the wasp cocoons, giving them an extra layer of protection. Scientists believe that the same wasp virus that infected it weeks before has now invaded the caterpillar's brain and caused this bizarre corruption of its normal behavior.
Amazingly, the caterpillar's natural aggression is now also exploited by the wasp virus. The caterpillar becomes a bodyguard, actively protecting the cocoons from other parasites. Beneath this peaceful landscape, a snail has eaten parasites. They've turned it into a zombie. These spectacular, bizarre, bulging eyeballs are the snail's tentacles. Inside them, parasitic worms have done an amazing feat of mind control. These parasites have taken over the snail's tentacles and its brain. It's all part of an ingenious plan to extend the life of the parasite and its offspring. The snail has become possessed. It is doomed now to follow the parasite's will. And the parasite is on the move. Looking for another host. Next, the parasite needs a bird. Hypnotized, the snail marches into the sunshine. They climb from the shade to the tips of exposed branches above. The snail's tentacles, engorged not by their possessors, have grown to resemble a maggot. And the maggot is the favorite food of the birds above. In an instant, the bird attacks and the parasite triumphs. The parasitic worm happily multiplies in the bird's stomach. Its final trick is to complete the cycle, but it will have to little trouble as the snails below graze on bird's droppings, filled with a new batch of mind-controlling parasites. Once they're eaten, the hypnosis of the snail will continue and the life cycle of the parasite will roll on. There are two types of parasitic plants, namely holoparasites and hemiparasites. Dodder is an example of a hollow parasite. Here, you can see how the dodder plant germinates and grows around its host. First, it searches for a host, in this case, the tomato. Tie the coils around the host's stem. The coils then make hostorial connections. forms regrowth from connection point, turning around and searching for more hosts. In the end, the host will be completely covered with dodger plant. Mosquitoes are usually vegetarian, preferring to drink nectar, fruit juices, and honeydew. 
Only a pregnant mosquito will bite humans, sipping nutrients from blood to nourish her developing eggs. If she drinks blood from someone infected with the malaria, she too becomes infected with the disease. The tiny drop of blood filling the insect's stomach is teeming with malaria parasites. The parasites form that is deadly inside humans cannot survive in a mosquito's stomach and it's slowly digested with the rest of her blood meal. However, back in the human host, a few of the parasites turn into a different type of cell, one that is sexual but remains dormant. Malaria sex is triggered when the warm human blood begins to cool inside the insect's stomach. The female former the parasites mature to an egg. A male form takes a while longer to mature into a sperm. This sperm is from an earlier fade. The fertilized egg can glide and begins to explore its new environment. It migrates to the outer lining of the mosquito's stomach before transforming into a cyst. Each cyst produces thousands of thin, tiny parasites which seek out and infest the mosquito's salivary glands. The next time the mosquito bites a victim, the malaria parasites will ride in with her saliva and infect another human. This year, 10% of people on Earth will be struck down with malaria. Most people who die from this disease will be pregnant women and children under the age of 5. At some stage in host parasite co-evolution, the relationship may become beneficial to both species. This relationship is termed mutualism. Mutualism is a relationship between members of two species in which the survival, growth, or reproduction is enhanced for individuals of both species. Mutualistic relationships involve many diverse interactions that extend beyond simply acquiring essential resources. The swollen thorn acacia and its namesake, the acacia ant, have developed harmonious role in each other's lives. The ant's role is a protector, and if any of those vines tries to steal the acacia's light, the ant security guards go to work. A few good chops on the vine stem, and it's light out for the vine. The ants don't stop there. This relatively huge grasshopper may think it's gonna take a few bites on the non-poisonous acacia. But the ants take a few bites out of it instead. And may throw in a few stings for good measure. In exchange for all this protection, 
the tree takes on the provider role. It gives the insect everything it needs in terms of food and shelter. These little nodules or nectaries secrete a sweet nectar for the adult ants to eat. And these brownish pods at the end of some leaves are the perfect nutrient-packed foods for the ants developing young, called larvae. Some bumblebee populations are in decline, a tragedy since they're among the few bees capable of buzz pollination. This technique is the only efficient way to pollinate plants like tomatoes, eggplants, and blueberries. The bumblebee grabs the flower by the anthers, decouples its flight muscles from the wings, and uses them to shake the flower violently. the only way to get the blossom to dislodge its pollen. While most people know the mistletoe is a great way to get a kiss at Christmas, a few realize it's actually a parasite. There are about 90 species of mistletoe in Australia alone, and they all send out roots that penetrate the bark of trees and siphon off water and nutrients. The question is, how did they get up to these aerial gardens in the first place? The mistletoe bird. It specializes in popping open parasites, ripe bearings, and swallowing the sticky contents. Thanks to the bird's modified digestive system, it only takes half an hour for the mistletoe seeds to pass undamaged from beak to bottom. And that's when the bird starts gardening. Simply by wiping its bottom, the mistletoe bird manages to plant the sticky cling in the perfect position to form a new aerial garden. The mistletoe's developing root quickly penetrates the branch of its host and starts siphoning off all the nutrients it needs. In the United States, there exists a cockroach lacking wings called Cryptocircus punctulatus. This wood-eating insect has become extremely rare. It takes 12 years from the egg hatch to grow a mature adult. Its gut system is complicated. It has symbiotic flagellates inside. About 40 species of pecular flagellates have been described. Still, there are more together with also a number of various rare species of bacteria. The cockroach cannot digest the wood particles. This occurs inside the flagellates, who absorbs them by endocytosis. Take a look inside the famous Barbilla nympha euphalula, which you see here. Inside the cell, you can see large wood particles which the cell has engulfed by endocytosis. On each side of it, there are a pair of rod-like centrioles, the largest known in any species. Unfortunately, the centrioles are not distinct here. Another flagellate is Trichonympha grandis. You see here, it's in front end, with a large cell nucleus the nucleolus, and the nuclear sac. On each side of nucleus, there are two dark rods. The inner pair are the centrioles, one longer than the other. The two outer rods, one on each side, are the rows of basal bodies for the cell's numerous flagellae. All the peculiar organisms you have seen here are mainly remained unchanged for more than half a billion years. They lack mitochondria, and developed through symbiosis of various interacting bacteria. The categorization of symbiosis types, mutualism, parasitism, commensalism, is an artificial construct. In reality, biological interactions do not always fit into such discrete categories. Rather, symbiosis should be perceived as a continuum of interaction ranging from parasitism to mutualism. Even the direction of a symbiotic relationship 
can change during the lifetime of the symbionts. Due to developmental changes, as well as changes in the abiotic and biotic environments in which the interaction occurs, according to Margulis and Sagan, life did not take over the globe by combat, but by networking. As in humans, organisms that cooperate with each other of their own or different species often outcompete those that do not. <laughs>